we the youth, we are suffering on a daily basis, whether it's relationship problems, whether it's failures, rejections, career issues. And we often just go to external things to alleviate that, right? We go out drinking, we go out, you know, to the clubs because we think that's going to release our suffering. Now, because we don't know who we are, and I guess we don't realize that the suffering is because of lack, lack of awareness. My question is that, do you think that if the youth begins to have this self-inquiry process, can they alleviate their suffering without being dependent on external factors? Absolutely. You know, I think it's helpful to start with yourself. Yes. Instead of starting with a spiritual teaching or a spiritual master, start with oneself. And then I begin to see that the way I'm leading my life, it is not giving me lasting happiness or fulfillment. It's giving me some kind of pleasure once in a while and a lot of unhappiness and a mounting sense of, you know, futility, despair. And then the spiritual teachings of different paths and different masters, they begin to make sense. So, for example, I see that whatever I've tried to do in my life, I've tried to do it for myself, to make this one person happy. And then we notice that it hasn't worked. Yeah. It hasn't worked. I've been doing it, as you said, 23 years, from babyhood to childhood to teenage to you know, uh, youth. We, are, we have been trying different ways to make ourselves happy. It's not working. When we look around and other people, we see, we see that it's not working also. And yet there are some people who are happy, who are fulfilled. Um, and when we look into their lives, we find certain common characteristics, which if you put them together, that's what's called spirituality. Selflessness instead of selfishness. Focus instead of distraction. Love instead of desire. And knowledge of the self, who or what we are, rather than knowledge of the world. So these are certain core ideas around which all spiritual paths are built. The claim of spiritual life is that fulfillment is actually possible. You see, people try to get fulfillment from the world, as you said, through relationships, through sense pleasures, in many ways, it's occupation, job, and they get mixed results, mostly um, kind of futility, unhappiness. Temporary. Temporary. And then people get this idea that maybe this is the best that's possible. And nothing more than is possible, then this is possible. Spirituality comes in here, yoga, Vedanta, the different spiritual paths. They say that no, deep uh, fulfillment is possible. Overcoming suffering is possible. So my answer to your question would be, start with yourself. See that there is a growing dissatisfaction with life. And then there is this promise that deep satisfaction is actually possible. Then which reasonable person wouldn't, you know, try to at least inquire uh, and, and practice that. With the path of Jnana, the path of knowledge, how can the youth practically implement those three stages of uh, listening, hearing, contemplating and meditating? If you can briefly explain that. Yes. Um, this is preeminently an age of uh, reason and experience. I don't know if there was a time in the past when one could say that um, follow religion because I say so or because the books say so or spiritual masters say so. Maybe at one time it, that was so, but right now it's no longer really possible. Uh, right now, uh, and I think it's a good thing that people want evidence. People want actual concrete proof. Um, and Jnana Yoga is actually very suited to that, the path of knowledge, the path of Advaita Vedanta. Because it starts with yourself. It doesn't start with a God or a promise of a heaven. Uh, it starts with what we are and who we are. And, the, you know, it's very easy, very interesting to compare the paradigms that are available to us. There's one paradigm of spirituality, which is a devotional paradigm. We are told that there is God. Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga. And you believe in God. Have faith, um, love, devotion, surrender, prayer. That's the way. The problem with that is it's not so easy to have that kind of faith, at least at the beginning. Then there is another path, the yogic path. I mean, he's calling it the yogic path, but it's found in various forms across the world in different religions. Um, that path says, not faith, not belief, but experience. So I will show you certain techniques 
and you follow these techniques and you will get some extraordinary experiences which will prove to you the claims of religion. So like Vivekananda said, if God exists, can I see God? If I have an immortal soul, I should be able to feel it. So this demand for empirical experience, empirical proof, uh, the yogic path is specially suited. I see that you on the table you have the, the Raja Yoga Raja. book. Yes, so this is preeminently a yogic path. It's okay. based on the Patanjali Yoga Sutras. And Swami Vivekananda, in fact, I think quite deliberately, this was the first book that he translated uh, and he taught in the United States. It was published from the Vedanta Society of New York, actually. Oh, wow. But there too, there is a slight um, hitch, a slight problem, if I may put it that way. Problem is this. Yogic path will give you experiences, but what kind of experiences? Those are extraordinary experiences. Samadhi-based experiences, what you might call mystical experiences. Kundalini, Kundalini uh, uh, awakening, uh, superconscious states of, uh, of the mind. Um, so, what one might call mystic experiences, visions and the like. And that's great. There are genuine mystical experiences which saints and mystics throughout the ages in different religions have testified to it and those are life transforming and it's a worthwhile path to pursue. The only difficulty is there too there's a possibility of skepticism because uh, who knows whether it's true, who knows whether the, the, you're having a mystical experience or you're just high or you're having a neuroscientist would say that you have a stroke in your brain or something that's what's making you feel that you're one with, yeah you feel that you're one with the universe but actually you are not, it's just a, a problem with your brain or something. So mystical experiences can be doubted. One reason is because they are not common experiences, right? So they are extraordinary, they are rare. Sri Ramakrishna is having a vision of Mother of Ma Kali. But if you read the description, he is an ecstasy. He is having the vision. But all the people around him, they are not having that vision. Yeah. They used to call him crazy. They used to call him crazy, most of them. Some of them believed him. Some who were spiritually advanced, they felt that, that ecstasy in the presence of Sri Ramakrishna. But most people, at least at that time, they would think, you know, he's, he's, he's a mad Brahmin of the Dakshineshwar, the priests of, priest of Kali and so on. And mystics of all ages have had to face that, uh, that charge, that, that you're just crazy, you're just plain mad. The peculiar advantage of the path of Advaita Vedanta is, it doesn't say that you have to believe in something. No, you have to understand, you have to realize it. It also doesn't say that you have to wait for extraordinary mystical experiences. It says our daily experiences, just like this, we are talking to each other, um, the experience of subject and object in this world. Ex who doesn't have that? All of us, all our experiences are subject and object. Or the experience of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. Who doesn't have a waking experience? All of us, we are awake. We dream. We also go into deep sleep. And Vedanta says that's enough to begin the inquiry into what we are. Uh, the experience of the five levels of the human personality. You know, the physical body, the vital body, the mental body, the intellect, and beyond that. Everybody, all of us, we have that. What Vedanta does is, it draws our attention to something that's already there, not a future mystical experience. Right here, right, right here. here, right now, everybody has it. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, whether you believe in Vedanta or not, that doesn't matter. What we need is your attention towards the most favorite subject of each one of us, we ourselves. Yeah. So you have to attend to your own experience of yourself and we need reasoning. We're going to reason, logically find out something in our own experience. So that's the beauty of Advaita Vedanta because it, it roots the uh, spiritual search in experience and reason. And again, experience means not the yogic kind of experience which says that do this, in future you will have some spectacular yogic experience. All true, all possible and it happens all the time. But it's rare and it's still in the future. But here we're talking about our quotidian experience, daily experience and an inquiry into that. So that's right the beauty now, of the Advaitic approach. Yes. When we both are speaking, yes. and this is in the present moment, yes. so who is speaking? It's not my mind, it's not my thoughts, it's my, are we both the consciousness that's basically shining on both of us, right? Right, but you do it this way. I am having this experience, this is my experience of life itself, right now. And here is this universe which I'm experiencing. In fact, Vedanta says, notice the nature of the experience. There are forms which you are seeing. There are sounds which we are hearing. 
bird. Uh, the sounds which we are hearing, um, smell, taste, touch. Then look inwards, not just these sense experiences. We are also having experiences, subtle experiences within. Uh, thoughts, memories, um, the ego, the sense of I. All of these, whether external uh, objects like form and taste and is coming from the world outside or internally generated. All of these are objects which we are experiencing. What is it that is experiencing all of it? We will immediately say, I am experiencing. But what's the nature of that I? Is it a body? And the body is also an object. I can see the body. I can um, touch it, taste it. Yes. Is it the mind? The mind is also something that I can experience. A first person internal experience will be in introspect. So these are all objects appearing to me. In that case, if the body is also an object to me, if thoughts and feelings are also objects to me, then I must be something that is not body and mind. And I, that one also must be aware because it's having all these experiences. So this bodiless awareness, this awareness which transcends mind and thinking, this is who I am. By experience and by logic. First, this pointing out is done. The, the methodology, the, uh, the logic behind it is understood. Then we must actually proceed to notice it. So there are actual exercises in Vedanta. For example, um, you take up an object outside. You take up, say, this, um, this Gerua cloth. You are seeing the Gerua cloth. And you notice the eyes are seeing the cloth. The eyes are different from the cloth. Then you do Now you have to focus your attention away from the cloth to the eyes themselves. You blink the eyes and open the eyes. You notice the eyes themselves. Then the eyes become the object of my experience. And who is experiencing? The mind. The mind is the seer and the eyes are the seeing now. Seen within coach. Then you draw your attention to the mind itself. Thoughts, emotions, ideas, um, memory. Those are also objects. There's something behind the mind. Something, some, I won't even say someone, some awareness. Now, which one am I? Am I an object out there or something in here? We'll always say, I'm in here. I'm here. The object is there. Then I am here. The object is the eyes. I am there. The object is the mind. And I am that awareness. And then you notice physical problems, illness, weakness, um, old age, even death. That's of the body, which is an object to Mental ups and downs. Depression, unhappiness, uh, even pleasure and pain, they are in the mind. I am the awareness. Because the awareness itself is different from the body and different from the mind, the awareness is not something that undergoes old age, disease or death. Awareness is not overweight, the body is overweight. Uh, the awareness is not, um, you know, uh, sick, the body can be sick. Awareness is not uh, depressed or frustrated. It's the uh, mind which is depressed or, or frustrated. I am aware of it, but I am not it. It's an argument. It's like a logical bit of reasoning. But actually what you do is you begin to see this. Sit quietly and notice this. Then your very conception of yourself begins to change. Body is still there with its problems. The world is still there with its problems. The mind is still there with its problems. But I find within myself an entirely problem-free existence. And from that perspective, now I can engage with the mind and the body and the world in a much more calm, powerful and effective way. Not in uh, some writer wrote, most men live lives of quiet desperation. So not in a way of desperation. Yeah. You know, inside that, call it the divinity, call it Atman, whatever you call it. But you're perfectly all right there. You're perfectly safe and secure there. From that position, when you deal with the mind and the body and the world, it's a much better way of, of being. You are always um, blissful. In a, you have to be careful with the word. Normally when they say blissful, um, it's a feeling in the mind. You know, happiness, bliss. Is that awareness blissful? Or the awareness is free of all kinds of problems, all kinds of limitation and suffering. When you see that, there is great peace and happiness in the mind. So that is a spiritual joy. And that does not depend on anything in the world. That's always there. Even if there are problems in the world, your inner peace is always there.
the process you just explained. Yeah. So I read a lot about Bhagwan Ramana Maharishi and I think his uh, neti, 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 when he does and he kind of eliminates like who you are and then he gets back to I am that pure awareness, pure consciousness. And I remember he, I think in his childhood, he used to lie down. Do you know that story? Yes. The story of Ramana Maharshi's enlightenment. Yes. So what he did was, as you said, he thought, what would it like to be dead? Yes. I don't think he did it many times. He just did it maybe the once. Okay. He just lay down on the floor in his room uh, and uh, he closed his eyes and pretended very hard to be dead. And he saw that could be that the body is dead. But he realized, I am this awareness beyond the body-mind. He made that breakthrough right there and then. And that's something, notice, it stayed with him effortlessly ever after. Yeah, He did a tremendous amount of like absorptive meditation. Uh, it's not really sadhana, you know. There's a very interesting thing about, about that. Sadhana, the word sadhana means practices. Um, it's uh, used in an instrumental sense. That means... I need to do something, like I need to come to Deogar. So that's my sadhya, the goal. Oh. And the sadhan which I use, the, the method or the instrument, would might be the train or the plane. And I am the sadhaka, the practitioner. So I, I, I am the one who's seeking a goal, and I do a practice in order to get to the goal. In Raman Maharshi's case, that's not true. He already made the breakthrough. He was not even looking for enlightenment. He just had this question and then he tried it hard. He imagined it. And then he tried hard and he made the breakthrough. Now afterwards you will see, it seems like very hard sadhana. He remained in samadhi for days and days and days on end without any care whether the body lived or not. He just wanted to go away from all distraction and remain absorbed in what he had found. That is so extraordinary. Now from, a, from the outside it looks like sadhana. But actually there, he is not seeking something. When we do a spiritual practice, we are seeking. We are seeking God or self-knowledge or whatever you call it. But he's not seeking. He's already found it. What he's doing there is, he is staying with what he has found. And it's, it might not be very much in his case like a deliberate practice. Because it's so powerful and so enormously attractive within. He just wants to stay with that. So that was... You might call it a sadhana. It's just staying with the realization that, that he has. Now, will it work if I just lie down on the floor and pretend to be dead? Will I become enlightened? Not necessarily. Most probably it won't work for us. Um, my personal belief and the belief of many um, you know, Vedantins would be he was already a spiritually very advanced person. He just needed a little bit to tip him over into something that probably he had already achieved in earlier lives. And then he remained in that state uh, ever after. It, again, I have to be careful. It's not even a state. It's his real nature. States are like states of the mind. Waking is a state of the mind. The same mind goes into another state, which is dream. It can go into absorptive trance states, meditative state. It can go into a deep sleep state. They are states. But you are not a state. You are the reality to which all states appear and disappear. Ramana Maharshi was centered in that reality. 